good morning. It's 11. And so right now 16 and people are still coming. Okay, so we can start. So first of all, uh, I don't remember if I mentioned uh, on Tuesday, of course, I postponed the homework uh, deadline. I think I did mention. Right, so it's due, I think, Tuesday, right, next week. All right, and uh, so what we've done in the previous class. We sort of started making uh, a big churn. Uh, in which sense? So up to this point, we've been using um, all the time uh, vector quantities, right? Vector quantities, uh, everything was based on um, forces, right? And Newton's second law, right? But of course, dealing with vectors are not very convenient. So we decided, what if we uh, try to develop <coughs> a somewhat alternative approach uh, to uh, address problems, right? So let's try to, so we decided to develop uh, a scalar approach, which of course understand, uh, you understand is an energy approach, right? And um, to do that, of course, we, uh, we cannot build a new foundation. We still use the same, we still have to use the same foundation uh, which we uh, laid down uh, in the first lecture of this semester, right? So we just grabbed Newton's second law, which is the vector equation, and in order to uh, get rid of the vectors in that equation. So we dot it, we take a, a scalar product uh, on both sides uh, with the <coughs> velocity, right? And scalar product, of course, uh, makes uh, a scalar uh, number out of uh, two vectors, right? So that was our approach, how um, we can dump vectors from the game, right? So we multiplied it, massage that equation slightly, and as a result, we ended up with uh, something like this. So d of m v squared over 2 equals to f dotted with dr. Okay, then, so we called this as uh, kinetic energy, so it's a completely new structure which we've never seen before, so it might be useful, so we decided to give it a cool name, kinetic energy. Energy of motion. Then, the left-hand side, I mean the right-hand side, we decided to call as work, work done by the force F uh, over infinitesimally small displacement dr, right? Okay, so as a result, we ended up with what is called work kinetic energy principle, right? Now, what should be next? Basically, we extracted everything that we can from the left-hand side. Nothing can be done on the left-hand side. But on the right-hand side, we still have a few options. Because we know that uh, this, is, uh, for, uh, this can be any force, or can be a superposition of several forces, right? So this is some kind of a net force. So some forces can be nice, some forces can be not nice, right? So we need to look at those cases. And of course, you understand where I'm going, right? By nice forces, uh, at some point in soon, soon. <coughs> By nice forces, I mean conservative forces. If a force is a conservative, then naturally we should be able to introduce potential energy on the right-hand side of the equation, right? So uh, that potential energy will be introduced as some kind of um, work done by something, right? And of course, we will introduce it properly. But you see, naturally, it should appear on the right hand side, on the right side of the equation. So that should be actually a natural next step uh, in the uh, in the discussion, in the in the process of developing this energy approach. But, but. Uh, so that will be the next logical step from the physical point of view, from the point of view of physics. But from the point of view of mathematics, we will uh, dive uh, into uh, something else. Okay, so let me um, integrate it, right? Integrate both sides in order to get uh, sort of if we, uh, in order to get uh, application of the work uh, kinetic energy principle over finite displacement, right, over finite displacement. And then, of course, naturally, we will have uh, integral over of that, 
which is work, right? Or <coughs> finite displacement. And then, of course, naturally, from the mathematical point of view, we need to refresh how to evaluate a line, line integrals. Yesterday, I was so almost, con I almost convinced myself to dump this um, review of line integrals. But then I thought, we already reviewed how to integrate over volume. You remember, uh, I, I integrated to find the center of mass of a cone, right? Then you uh, integrated over a surface to find, again, center of mass. And now, okay, why not? Let's just also review, evaluation, uh, review how to um, evaluate line integrals. So, today, first we will refresh how to evaluate line integrals, and then potential energy. And again, everything naturally appears out of the right-hand side of the equation, right? Okay, so now let me first uh, get the line integral, because right now the integral is not here. So now let's assume that we have some um, particle, some, yeah, particle. So let's say this is uh, initial position, uh, position of the particle at the initial moment of time, position vector r1, this point is defined, position of that point is defined by um, position vector r2. So this is some kind of point mass, right, exposed to some uh, force, right, some force, net force, or maybe single force, right. So, of course, infinitesimally small displacement uh, dr, right. And then, of course, we can integrate in order to move from this infinitesimally small <coughs> quantities to a quantities of a finite displacement. But before I do this integration, which is trivial, of course, I want to tell you this. How, ch how should we look at this work kinetic energy principle? Uh, of course, if work is positive and it happens when uh, the angle between the displacement and the force is... Uh, less than 90 degrees. And of course, uh, work is negative when the angle is larger than 90 degrees, right? So, uh, in simple words, what does it mean? Positive work, negative work? Basically, what do we have here? We have a system, in our case it's a point mass system, which we want to describe using energy approach, and we have the outside world, right? And of course, energy can go into the system or out of the system. So, effectively, Work, work, works. Sounds funny, right? Work works as a bridge between the system and the outside world. If work is positive, basically in that case, uh, energy is taken from the outside world and dumped into the system. As a result, what happens? Kinetic energy of the system goes up. All right. But if work uh, is negative, it means what? So uh, we take energy from the system and dump it back into the outside world. As a result, kinetic energy of the system goes down, right? So it gets depressed. So as I said, so work uh, works uh, sort of like a bridge between the outside world and the system, moving energy either into the system or out of the system. Work positive or Depending on uh, if the work is positive, then we increase energy. If work is negative, then oh, we move the energy into the outside world, right? Okay, so it's nice to think in this way, for example. And now, yeah, back to integral. So, of course, we can integrate it, right? So, integral of dt and integral of f dot dr. And, of course, we naturally get so change in the kinetic energy between the final and the uh, initial point. So let's say kinetic energy over here to T2 here, T1. So delta T equals to, okay, T2 minus T1 equals to the integral of F dot dr. Right. <coughs> and as I said, so here naturally, from the physical point of view, we should start introducing a potential energy because some of the forces can be nice conservative, right? But let's just uh, first naturally uh, discuss the uh, natural step from the mathematical point of view. Let's refresh how to evaluate um, line integrals. Another thing, right? Um, we can have 
um, several forces, not just one. Right, so let me write, uh, if, if there are several forces acting on the system, right, of course then in this case, uh, the change in the kinetic energy of the system will be equal to the uh, sort of calculate work done by the first system, the second, oh, by the first force, the second force, and uh, all those forces and add them all up, add them all up. So it will be summation over all forces, uh, W i, for example, right? Of which is, of course, natural because the integral is an additive thing. Okay, so now, um, yeah, as I said, now let's put a big bullet and let me write digress to uh, refresh a line integrals. Again, as I said, I, will almost, I almost convinced myself yesterday to change it, but I mean to skip it, but then decided to still review that. So let's assume that uh, we have a, some force, uh, of course, which is a vector function of x and y, and it has x component. Let's say, uh, let's say x component, it's a function p, which is a function of x and y, and of course, which I, okay, I used I hats, okay. Then plus uh, Y component, it's some function Q, which can be a function of X and Y, and yeah, that is the Y component. And of course, uh, naturally, we have R position vector, which is of course X, uh, X, oh, no, no, not that X, <coughs> I, hat plus y j hat. And of course, dr will be, of course, dr is uh, dr i, oops, dx plus dy j hat. Right? And of course, if you take a dot product, integral of f dot dr will be what? Uh, an integral, let me open the square bracket. will be P um, dx plus Q dy and yeah, that's it. And so now how uh, we can take this integral? Of course, here we have x and y, two uh, variables. Of course, we cannot integrate if we have two variables in an integral. Of course, we need to convert each integral into an ordinary integral of a single variable of integration, right? Yeah. So, and there are a few cases. The simplest case, the simplest possible case, <coughs> what if p is the function of x only? This p is a function of x only. Then, uh, and q is a function of y only, then immediately we can integrate. Uh, this and that separately. So that's the simplest case. Now, what if <coughs> p and q are not a functions of a, of a single variable x or y? Uh, in that case, we need to find the, we need to know the relationship between x and y, right? So in this case, it's a line integral. In this case, some uh, trajectory, some curve, some line must be given, right? So the, we need to have a dependence between x and y. So let's assume I will now put uh, probably a small bullet. And which function I use? Okay, uh, f. <coughs> so if, which I wrote, if a curve is given, and let's say y equals f as a function of x. I hope you don't hear the noise outside, cleaning people, vacuuming the floor, right, in the corridor. Right. <coughs> okay, uh, if this is given, then of course, uh, it's, uh, uh, we just need to replace all y's in the integral with uh, x's, right. So in this case, um, we need to uh, just take dy 
calculate. So dy will be equal f prime of x uh, dx, right? And as a result, we can, or maybe I can squeeze it still here. As a result, integral of f dot dr will be equal. So an integral, again, square bracket, uh, p x y, so it will be p x instead of y, of course, it will be f f of x, all right, oh no, let me use this, uh, not a square bracket, it's just this bracket, uh, p dx, and plus q, of course, x, f of x, and instead of uh, dy, it will be f prime, f prime of x, dx, yeah, and now we can close the a square bracket, and now we have a single variable of integration only. All right, so we can uh, put a limit, so let's say from x1 to x2, for example. All right, so uh, it's a second way. Okay, second option, not second way. Of course, the easiest one, as I said, if this is the function of x only, this is the function of y only, then trivial. Otherwise, if curve is given, <coughs> you can do this. If curve is given in this form, I mean in this form, as an explicit relationship between x and y. But sometimes you can have a parametric, uh, I mean, uh, the curve can be parameterized. Um, the curve can be given in a parametric form. All right. And now uh, let's look at that case. If a curve is given in a parametric form. All right. So it's a first small bullet, now the second. All right, so if a curve is given in a parametric form, is given in a parametric form, and then we will look at the example of all these cases, parametric, Form, uh, which phi and xi. Okay, so x equals phi as a function of t. So the parameter t, it can be time, it can be something else, right? It can be some angle, like in our case, um, in the example which we will look at. We will look at in a few minutes. So x and then say let's y. Oops. Y equals to psi as a function of time. So that's the parameterization. And, and so now we just need to dump both x and y uh, in our integral, right? And replace with uh, our parameter t, so which is going to be our variable of integration. So we need to uh, look at uh, dx and dy. So dx equals phi prime of t dt and dy, of course, psi prime of t dt, right? And now I just need to replace all x's and all y's with that. Okay, let me just rewrite it so it will be uh, here. So integral of f dot dr equals so integral, and let me open the square bracket, p instead of x, phi of t, uh, instead of y, psi of t, right? So that's just p. Now dx, dx is that, phi prime, phi prime of t, dt, and plus, okay, now let me write the second, uh, term lower, so it will be the same q, now phi of t, psi of t, and psi prime out of t dt. Actually, I probably should have, I should maybe, I should be able to squeeze it in. Okay, so now we can close this bracket, and that's uh, the last, uh, possible situation when par parameter is given. Okay, so that's 
uh, the stuff review. And now let's look at the example. Let's look at the example. Yeah. So, um, you know what? Since in this example I need some space, uh, yeah, I'll just start erasing them later. So, example. So, force is given in this form. F equals, so X component of the force, it's X. Y component of the force, 2 Y. Right. So, that's two-dimensional force, two-dimensional situation. All right, and then, uh, of course, there must be some displacement of it. Of course, finite displacement, and we're going to move from point 0, 0 to point 1, 1. Okay, let me draw that case. Um, okay, let me, yeah, let me use black. So, this is y. Uh, this is x. So let's say this is point one, also point one. Okay, let me. So that's point uh, P, where we want to find, I mean, uh, uh, we want to find the work done by this force as uh, some particle, some object moves from this point, from the origin from O to point P. And of course, we need to, uh, when you move, you have to move along a certain path, right? So let's pick a few examples, a few paths. And uh, in this example, uh, they asked us to evaluate the integral over this path. So first one, option A, along the x-axis and then along the y-axis. Right, so, this red is A, and uh, let me label this point as, so it's a O, I think I use Q, yeah. Let me call that point as Q. Later on I will use it. For now I don't need it, but in a minute. Second path, okay, let me use blue. It's a straight line. So that will be option B. And, of course, we move that way. And the last option, parametric form, right? Which parameter, right, I will give you when we get to that option. So the last option, this one. Some, some kind of curve. And the parameter which will be used, it's uh, that angle theta between the uh, x-axis, sort of negative x-axis direction, and the line which goes from point Q to the point on the curve. Ah, so that is C, option C. Okay, so we need to evaluate, um, calculate work, calculate work done by this force as a uh, point object moves from point O to point P, right? Okay, so I think I give everything. Yeah. I gave you all my heart, right? And now, um, okay, so let's start. Part A, it's a part, it's a curve A. Part B, curve B, and so on. All right, uh, so work done in option A, W sub A. All right, um, okay, let me start immediately first with writing down the integral, all right? So it will be uh, F X DX. Okay, maybe I should have written first as a dot product, F dot DR, right? And then, so F X DX plus F Y DY. And since we have uh, two um, 
parts, one is horizontal, one is vertical, right? So it makes sense to split the integral into two parts. Right. So, so it will be first integral of uh, fx, it's x dx, then fy 2y dy. Actually, that is the first example. You remember I told you if uh, p, okay, here I used p as a function of x only and q as a function of y only, then uh, integration is, is trivial, right? But since the path is kind of um, tricky, so I decided to split into two parts, two. So this first one, uh, from O to Q, O, Q, right? And so what's so special about this path? Uh, y equals zero. So in this part, y equals zero. All right, and, and, and x changes from zero to one, right? So x, of course, between zero and one, right? Okay, and the second integral, of course, plus integral over from q to p, q to p, and of course the same x dx plus 2y uh, dy. And so what's special about this part, x equals 2, uh, 1, and y changes from 0 to uh, 1, right? Okay, so now let's look. So y equals... No, something is, something is, y equals zero. Ah, yeah, everything is fine. Good, good. No. Ah, I see. That's why I'm looking. It's, it doesn't look familiar, right? So I saw this problem a few times, and... I'm looking at and uh, some something is not is not right. Okay, uh, this is y two x. How did I uh, write in a wrong way? So it's a y two x. Sorry, that's why I'm looking right, and it doesn't look familiar, right? Uh, but I keep rolling because yeah, it, <laughs> that's what I. But I wrote it in the. I made the mistakes just writing this. So it's a y two x. That's why I was surprised that uh, I see this situation when uh, p is the function of x and q is the function of y. I don't remember this case, right? It doesn't sound right. Sorry, but it happens. All right, so this is y and this is 2x. y, 2x. Okay, yeah, that's <clears throat> because now I'm looking and I'm not getting a zero, which I'm supposed to get. All right, okay. Yep, yep, yep. So also here y and uh, 2x. y and uh, 2x. Okay, now whew, better. So uh, y equals 0. First term is 0. Then uh, dy also will be 0. dy. So this whole first integral is 0. And the second case, uh, x is constant x equals 1, so this is 0, and of course this is not 0, but x, this x equals to 1, right? because x is fixed, right? So as a result, we're getting integral of 2 dy, it's uh, that term, and of course y changes from 0 to 1, right? So trivial integral, of course, uh, that is 2. So that's the work done. Units are, are not given, but if uh, force is in Newtons, right? So um, then, of course, it will be joules. Now, part uh, B. And, okay, maybe I will be able to uh, write still over here. So part B. Right. So part B. It's a straight line at 45 degrees, y equals 2x. Right. So y equals 2x, and of course, dy equals 2 dx. Right. So now, uh, start from here. Right. So now it's w sub b. 
equals to integral uh, y, uh, y dx, y equals to x, so it will be x dx, then 2x and dy is dx, so it will be 2x dx plus 2x dx, and in this case, of course, I'm not splitting the integral because there is no any point of splitting it. All right, so single, var single variable integral over x, so we can write, so x changes from 0 to 1, 0 to 1, and so it's a 3x dx. So x squared over 2, lower limit 0, upper limit 1, so it's a 1 over 2, 3 over 2, 1.5. But again, since uh, not a single word about nature of function f, and so as a result, I'm kind of afraid to write units because the example doesn't give us any, any information about the nature of that function f. And the last one, uh, parametric form. Okay, now I have to uh, invade this part of the board. Okay, so now the last, this last example, and then, yeah, we'll start moving into physical meaning of the right-hand side uh, of that work kinetic energy principle. So C, A, B, and C, and the parametric form. Of course, I don't remember. So it's this. R, position vector of this point, right, basically, position vector of that point on the curve. Of course, it's x, y, x, y, and what is x? x is 1 minus cosine theta. Theta, it's this angle. So that's x, and y is sine of that angle theta. So, and of course, theta changes uh, from 0 when we are at the origin and to pi over 2 when point is at p. So theta is between 0 and pi over 2. So that's, that's the parameterization of that curve. Okay, so now we just need to, again, the same integral, but now we need to get rid of x and y's and write in terms of uh, theta. So x is here, uh, y is there, so now we need to write dx and dy. So dx equals, so we just need to differentiate this, uh, minus, minus, plus, it will be sine theta, d theta. So that's dx, right? Yeah. And of course dy, oops, and dy, of course, it will be cosine theta d theta. Okay, so now let's, we are ready to write down the integral. So it's a w sub c equals integral. F, uh, again, now there is no point of splitting it, of course, fx. Okay, I will probably look at this y. <coughs> Where is my y? y is sine. So uh, sine theta, then times dx. dx is this, another sign, so it will be sine squared uh, d theta, then plus 2x, where is my x? x, 1 minus cosine theta, 1 minus cosine theta, and then uh, dy, dy is this, so cosine theta d theta, and now, okay, I need to close one break. You know that universal law conservation of brackets. If you open three brackets, you must close three brackets, right? And so now it's a single pri uh, integral over a single variable theta. So now we can write the limit. So between 0 and uh, pi over 2. Okay, I'm not going to take this integral, although it's quite simple. You just need to reduce the power of sine squared and cosine squared using those uh, trig identities, right? 
which allows you to reduce the power, so which is what uh, sine squared theta equals one minus cosine two theta over two, right? And the same with cosine cosine squared theta, but now with plus one plus cosine two theta over two, right? So reduce the power and then simple integrals of sine and cosines. And you will end up with uh, 2 minus pi over 4. So which is equal to what? 1.21. Uh, right? So all possible situations. So after this, yeah, we reviewed integration over a volume, over a surface in your homework. Now a line integrals should be enough. <coughs> All right. Isn't this similar to um, what is it? Um, a a Brownstone curve or whatever it is like the Barakista curve. Yeah. We Isn't will get like... to Barakista uh, curve. Where will it be? Uh, I think it's a chapter six when we start uh, looking at calculus of variations, right? Um, maybe, you know what, I didn't compare, but it looks, uh, it looks similar, right? I don't want to lie uh, because sort of I didn't put them next to each other, right? And uh, I didn't compare it. But it looks, yeah, I think similar. I, I remember we, we would uh, use this substitution, but there will be factor in front. A times one minus cosine theta when we are going to evaluate this integral in chapter six. And naturally, uh, brachista chrome curve will appear. Right. It sounds like, yeah, similar. But again, I, I don't want to lie. All right. um, quite possible. Thank you. I just need to <laughs> put them next to each other in order to see if that is right or not. All right. Yeah, but the brachista chrome curve, it's a very interesting curve. Lots of interesting um, properties. But we will get there. Uh, okay, yeah, we finished this, and now back to uh, our work. Let me erase this. To the right-hand side of work kinetic energy principle, because some of those forces can be nice, and maybe we can make our life even slightly easier. But again, what we are going to introduce now, it's not completely needed. If you hate it, right, you can, you can just go back to your work kinetic energy principle, and that's basically universal. We derived it from the Newton second law, and we haven't imposed any restrictions. So a work kinetic energy principle you can use for any force, conservative, non-conservative, good, bad, or ugly, right, any force, and no restrictions. Just grab it and use it, and uh, you will be able to describe motion of any any uh, classical mechanical system. But maybe we can tweak now something and maybe we can introduce like potential energy and maybe uh, we will like it and it will look better, more convenient, right? And so on, right? But again, it's not completely needed. It's not like we must to do that, no. <clears throat> but why not just to make our uh, life in research easier, right? Okay, so now, uh, title, let me label it potential energy and conservative forces. Right, so let me put a new bullet. Uh, potential energy and of course conservative forces. You know what, before we start uh, defining all this, right? I usually give this fairy tale example, right? First, it sounded silly, but then the more I use it, I like it, right? Uh, because the uh, appearance of uh, potential energy is so natural, completely. Uh, any uh, normal human being, if uh, he, uh, he or she ran into this situation, would come up with this idea. It's like, uh, imagine, right, like here we live in Lowell, right? So there is the Boston, right? So let's say you decide to go for a ride to Boston, right? Uh, by car, right? So if you, if you take route 495 and then a route 93, let's say it in this fairy tale world, let's say it costs you five bucks. 
If you change the route, let's say you take first the route, I don't know, three, then two, still five bucks. If you take 495, then two, still five bucks. If you take any local roads, uh, routes, still five bucks. It doesn't matter which route you take, and every time it will cost you five bucks. Sooner or later, most of people of, who lives in Lowell will start calling a Boston like a five buck city. Because we have, we have a unique number associated with the point in space where the Boston is, right? It's just a completely normal response, especially if, if the Boston were called, the uh, name of Boston were kind of, kind of complicated, right? And or Rio de Janeiro, right? Or Minnesota, it's kind of too long. Of course, we would start calling it uh, five, or five bucks or something like that, right? And so then, in a similar way, you can introduce a, a unique number associated with the point uh, where New York is, uh, let's say, 100. 500 will be connected, connected with Chicago, and 3,000 with LA. So you see the whole map of the country can be covered with these unique numbers, right? So, of course, it makes sense uh, to utilize, to use them, all right? Uh, and, and, it will happen, and, and it will happen to be, it will happen to be useful. And, of course, you, you give it a cool name, of course, potential energy, and that's basically the idea behind potential energy, because you can introduce a unique number connected with the point in space. But we have to be careful. Because, okay, now, so you introduce this you know, cool quantity, new one, potential energy, you feel proud, right? You brag to your family, right? To your girlfriends, boyfriends, and then you go to your neighbor, right? To brag, so to make them feel jealous, right? Let's say you go to Andover and start bragging to them, so how cool you are, All right? You say, okay, Boston is a five bucks, right? And they said, you know what? We come up with a something similar, but you're a big fat liar because it's not five, which is connected with Boston, but four. So we created confusion, right? And they called us a big fat liars, right? Why? Because we all measured uh, our set of numbers relative to the reference point which was or which is in Lowell. That's the point where the potential energy equals to zero. That's what we call the reference point. But those guys measured uh, all their numbers relative to reference point in Andover. As a result, numbers are different, which can, be, uh, which can create some confusion, right? So, as a result, so whenever you use potential energy, you need to tell people where is your reference point, right? Of course, there are some situations, right, where uh, there is sort of like a convention. Uh, so the best point is, for example, at infinity, right? But usually uh, a reference point is at infinity if you have a system which is finite, right? Like, for example, point charge, right? Uh, uh, yeah. In case of gravitational force, uh, point mass, right? Or a set of point masses, uh, but of course, if they're conf confined in a finite uh, volume, right? In that case, every time the reference point is at infinity, right? But otherwise, uh, every time, show to people where is your reference point. And that's what I usually try to get out of students every time, especially when we get to the Lagrangian formalism, where everything based on energies. And every time you have to introduce potential energy carefully, right? And very often when students kind of sloppy in terms of showing where is the reference level is or reference point, as a result, they're using, uh, they, they can lose minuses easily. As a result, their potential energy goes into the uh, Lagrangian with the wrong sign. Because they're kind of not very confident or they think, ah, it's, it's, it's banal, it's trivial, it's obvious, right? As a result, they lose, uh, okay, they change the signs. Right? So you have to be careful. Right, so the reference point is uh, kind of important. And you see the <coughs> so appearance of the potential energy is absolutely natural, absolutely normal. Right? Because it doesn't matter which route you take, every time you will end up with the same number. So that's why we can introduce potential energies only for conservative forces. That's why before we can introduce potential energy, we need to define which forces, uh, which forces uh, can be called as a conservative. And of course, uh, this fairy tale world was the world of conservative forces, right? So now let's define exactly uh, which forces can be called conservative. So we're going to state uh, two conditions that must be satisfied so that we can call a force as a conservative force. And then we will change those conditions slightly, uh, I think maybe in a class, right? Or maybe next class, next class. Okay, so now, so let me, uh, I will just probably rewrite from my notes 
these conditions. First, I will write this. So only um, I'm just um, thinking how should I write? Uh, okay, let me write in my words. So, uh, a conservative force can lead to a potential energy or conservative force. Conservative forces can um, <clears throat> okay, can lead to uh, potential energies. Couldn't phrase better. <clears throat> Right. Uh, and the more you start thinking in, in, uh, in front of the whiteboard, the more um, your brain starts panicking, right? Okay, all right. Uh, and so now let's just uh, state conditions. So the first condition, force must be a function of position only. Right. And that's the trouble with, the, uh, with uh, magnetic force. Right. So there is a velocity in the magnetic force, and the magnetic force, it's a, it's a troublemaker, a big troublemaker, right. relative to other forces. All right, so F, F must, be, um, function, must be a function of position, right? So let me write uh, conditions. Let me write conditions uh, for a force to be conservative, for uh, a force to be conservative. And then next class we will slightly change it to make it, to make them, um, to make them better. All right, so first, uh, first condition, F depends only on particle's position. F depends, okay, let me abbreviate, on R only. So no funny stuff, no velocities, right? Sometimes still, uh, if force is a function of time, you can still introduce potential energy. Right? But we're not going to look at those cases. There is a small section in the book where uh, it goes over that. I think once, one, one, one year I went through that and then I decided to skip it. So then, second, uh, of course, the work done by the force must be path independent. Right, so the work uh, between two points, let's say one and two. Done by F, of course, done by our force. Is path independent. Okay, so of course it's worth of framing. Right. And so only for these forces we can introduce potential energy. Yeah. Because if you, for example, have, let's say, friction force, of course we never heard about potential energy connected with the friction force because you change the path, friction is constant, let's say kinetic friction. So you can take it outside of the integral, right? And then it will be just a force times the, uh, the displaced, not the displacement, the uh, path, the, the length of the path. Right? And of course, the longer the path, the larger the uh, work is going to be, right? So of course, as a result, uh, with the final point, we can associate as many numbers as we can. It depends on the path you take to evaluate your integral. Right? <coughs> so just naturally, you cannot introduce potential energy. And so now uh, let's actually define uh, the conservative, or not conservative, um, let's write down a definition of potential energy. Right? And, and, and then we will uh, connect it 
with the work kinetic energy principle. Maybe it should be logical, maybe next time I will think, maybe I will just uh, grab the work kinetic energy principle, massage, I will massage maybe the right hand side in order to get naturally uh, the um, definition of potential energy, right? But book, since book, uh, the book presents uh, potential energy in this way, so I followed, right? But then with time, when you present it, present it, you start thinking maybe this, it's better to present it this way or that way. Right? <clears throat> so you start changing. So, um, so definition of potential energy. Um, definition of potential energy. Wow, this marker is, uh, smells strong. So, um, U, of course, potential energy, as a function of R, it's equal. Of course, it must be, uh, it has some, it should have a structure of integral of f dot dr because that's, uh, that should naturally appear on the right hand side of that equation <coughs> of the work kinetic energy principle. So it's an integral from some point r naught which is the reference point. Basically it means that potential energy at this point r naught equals to zero that's our reference point Okay, so it's an integral from the reference point to the point where you want to calculate your potential energy. <coughs> then F, as a function of, I will put R prime. Why R prime? Because we have uh, R as our upper limit, so it's better to, to distinguish them, to separate them. It's better to call it R prime, the variable of integration. Dotted with D R prime. But, it's not the whole thing. In order to make, because this is, appears naturally on the right-hand side of the equation. You remember work kinetic energy principle. Kinetic energy on the left-hand side, uh, U appears on the right-hand side, so that we can move potential energy to the left-hand side with the plus. It's better to put here minus. Right, so as a result, if we put here minus, we can move potential energy to the left-hand side with plus, and as a result, we can introduce total mechanical energies, T plus uh, U, right? So that's why we need to put minus in order to make it look better, more um, convenient. So it will be negative work done by this force as we move from the reference point, whatever reference point you pick, you have freedom pretty much to pick any point as your reference point, no restrictions unless there's some sort of unwritten conventions. But basically, you have <coughs> constitutional freedom to use any reference point your soul desires, right? So that's the definition. And now we just naturally, we just need to connect it with uh, the work kinetic energy principle in order to get something slightly different. Right. But again, if you, if you don't like this, okay, just work kinetic energy principle. Calculate works done by all forces, conservative or non-conservative or whatever. And you can solve problem. <coughs> yeah, so now uh, let's, uh, let me check. Yeah, everything is mentioned. Mm -hmm. And now let's uh, connect it with... Um, work kinetic energy principle. <clears throat> so, 
All right, let me write it this way. Let's connect it with a work kinetic energy principle. Or theorem, whatever. Different books use different uh, names. Uh, yeah, names. So, uh, so we assume that force is conservative, yeah, because that's what we have, right? So F is conservative, of course. F is conservative. And, of course, uh, work is path independent, right? So, of course, that is given. And now let's take, let's assume that, for example, this is our reference point, R0. And then uh, let's take two completely arbitrary points, R1 and R2. R1 and R2. So R1 and R2 are arbitrary. Any points. And so let's calculate the work done as you move from uh, point R, which one? Yeah, from uh, the reference point to R2. So let's calculate the work done as you move, which way I wrote it in the brackets, okay? From R0 to R2. <clears throat> okay, so since we're dealing with uh, conservative force, that's why I emphasized and wrote again at the very beginning, right? that all these correct. So work is path independent. So if you want to go from R1, R0 to R2, of course, you can, you can change the path and the work will be still the same. Instead of going directly to R2, you can go first to R1 and then from R1 to R2. Why not? Path independent, right? So I can use any path I want. <coughs> so I can write as work done from as you move from R0 to R1, plus, oi, bracket, uh, plus work done as you move from R1, e, I don't like that I'm overlapping it, right. R1 to R2. Right. So I can, instead of going this way, I can go first that, and then this way. Okay, so then uh, let me take this, solve it for this. So it will be a W between these two arbitrary points, R1 and R2, equals to, and this will go, of course, to that side. So we'll have W of from R0 to R2. Damn it again, I... I hate changing the angle plus <laughs> work done from R0 to R1. You see why I was standing and thinking how should I... The whiteboard is small, so I'm trying to save as much to, uh, space as possible. Int, int. So now, what is work done as you move from R0 to R2. It's the work. This is work as you move from R0 to point R and minus in front. So basically what we have here, it's a negative potential energy at the point R2 from the definition. Because this is just basically minus work done as you move or, or as the particle uh, object moves from the reference point to the point in question, to the point where you want to find the potential energy. And that's what we have here. But of course, uh, if we add, but we need minus. So basically, this is uh, minus u at r2. 
And of course, the second work exactly the same, but uh, at point R1. So this is potential negative potential energy at point R1. Okay, so now we can uh, write it as W between the work done between two arbitrary points equals to minus U at R2 minus potential energy at R1. I took in the minus outside. So it, it is equal to minus change in the potential energy between those two arbitrary points. Okay, so we're getting, so from one side, you know what, first let me write this work, of course, between which way I wrote it. Um, ah, yeah, let me write between two arbitrary points equals to negative change in the potential energy. Of course, uh, you, you remember that, right? You use it um, in physics one many times. So now, from uh, one side, W equals to the change in the kinetic energy. That's our work kinetic energy principle. And from the other side, the same work equals to the change in the potential energy, of course, if the force is conservative, right? Of course, this is true only if, you, if your force is conservative. All right, so, so from one side, uh, work equals to a change in the kinetic energy, work kinetic energy principle, and from the other side equals to the negative change in the potential energy. So this is what we derived now, and that is work kinetic energy principle. So now, of course, we can combine these ends. So it will be delta T plus U, and you see why we introduce this minus, right? So that it minus appears here, <coughs> and we can move to the left-hand side, combined with kinetic energy, and we will have T plus U. And it equals to zero. So it looks like, huh, we're getting that kinetic plus potential energy as the system leaves, as the system evolves, it doesn't change. Okay, so something is conserved. So let's get, let's give it a cool name again. Total mechanical energy. Kinetic energy plus potential energy, total mechanical energy. <coughs> so, um, so T plus U is conserved. So as a result, uh, introduce, as a result, let's introduce a new quantity. Total mechanical energy, by definition, three lines, T plus U. Right, so total mechanical energy. So again, you see everything appears naturally. Again, we started just from the Newton second law in the previous class. Then we massaged it, introduced the work kinetic energy principle. Then we dived, uh, looked deeper at the definition of work F dot dr if forces, un if the force or if a forces, if forces are nice, conservative, then naturally we can introduce potential energy. And then by combining uh, potential and kinetic energy, we can get naturally um, uh, mechanical energy, total mechanical energy. Right. So everything appears naturally, everything can be derived and again derived from the foundation, from the Newton second law. Right. So most of the books, uh, they present Newton second law, yeah, with those auxiliary laws, right, as a foundation. I think except for, I think Landau Lifshitz, uh, theoretical uh, mechanics there, theoretical mechanics, they, I think, uh, they present um, a laws of uh, conservation as the foundation, and then, then the rest is built on that. But usually, it's just Newton's second law in the Newtonian formalism, and the rest can be built, and conservation of mechanical energy also follows. 
Okay, so now uh, we can, of course, frame this. Very important. And, yeah, conserv uh, conservation of mechanical energy. So as a result, E is constant. So conservation of mechanical energy. Right. So, um, and again, they said that's what basically all theoretical classes should be, right? So you lay down the foundation and then the rest must be derived. If you cannot derive something from the foundation, it means that your foundation is not complete and probably that something must be added to your foundation, right? Also, that foundation must be somehow changed, right? But otherwise, any theory, any theoretical course uh, structured that way. Right, right so um, <clears throat> of course if, if, if you have more than one conservative force acting on the system, like for example if you have a mass and spring system, right, and it's exposed to the uh, force of gravity at the same time, so mass oscillates on the spring, as a result you have uh, two conservative forces acting on the mass the spring force and the gravity as a result in that case you can introduce two potential energy of course you can introduce as many potential energies as you need right it depends on the number of uh, conservative forces acting on your system <coughs> right so mm -hmm. if there are, are several conservative forces Right. Um, and let's say one particle, then of course you will still have one kinetic energy and several potential energies. Right, of course. Several conservative forces, then uh, the total mechanical energy would be equal to what? Kinetic plus you know, U1 plus U2 and plus so on, depends on how many um, conservative forces you have in your system, acting on your system. Okay, so now, next logical step, right? Again, we're still playing with the right-hand side, basically, of the work kinetic energy principle, right? Uh, so what if, uh, now we looked, what if all the forces are conservative on the right-hand side? But what if some of the forces are conservative and some of the forces are not conservative, right? So we just need to adjust it again slightly. But again, all this is not needed. If you just hate this, you can just use new, uh, you can use a work kinetic energy principle and you don't need anything, uh, anything else. I, yep, I can erase this. Right. So which way I should write? Um, Let me put a new bullet and if uh, there is a non-conservative force, if there is a non-conservative force, non-conservative, I think we should write it without hyphen, non-conservative Of course, the most typical, it's just a friction, of course, you know, right? <clears throat> so, on top of conservative forces, there is a non-conservative force, right? And again, as I said, work kinetic energy principle has no limitations, has no restrictions, right? So, work kinetic energy principle, so the change in the kinetic energy equals to the work done by all forces. It doesn't matter which one, which... Right, so, but of course we can naturally split because it's just an integral. We can split it into the work done by uh, conservative forces plus work done by a non-conservative. And C stands for non-conservative force. Right. 
Okay, so now we just showed that for if a force is conservative, uh, it equals to the negative change in the potential energy. So this is uh, this is this equals to minus uh, delta u, and with this nothing can be done because it's a non-conservative force. We can identify we cannot associate a unique number with the final point, so just need to calculate work. Nothing. And, of course, this can be moved to the left-hand side, like we've done there, to get the total mechanical energy. So the change of T plus U equals to the work done by a non-conservative force. So that's basically what you have to use if there is a friction, for example, acting on your system. Right. So now here... Total mechanical energy was conserved, and now you know, there is a leakage, right? So energy, mechanical energy leaks through the uh, through a non-conservative force, whatever non-conservative force acting on the system, right? Right. So this we can say it's leakage. So energy leaks through that term. Right, work done by the non-conservative forces. And again, if you don't want to remember this, work kinetic energy principle. Everything comes up, it comes uh, naturally out of that. Okay, so now it's time <coughs> to look at one example. You remember that example, I think it was the first one uh, in the first chapter uh, when we had the block sliding uh, down the inclined plane um, and of course under, uh, under the influence of the gravitational force and there was a friction force. So now let's solve that problem but now using energy approach in order to see advantages and disadvantages of um, applying Newton's second law and energy approach. Because now basically we have two alternative approaches. Force approach using Newton's, which is based on Newton's second law, or you can use this um, energy stuff. Right. Okay, so now let me e, 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 e erase it, yeah. So uh, I, will I wouldn't be able to finish this example, but I, let me just at least state the example. Uh, and then we will solve it next class. It's still not that complicated, right? but again, the goal is to compare different methods. Right. <clears throat> and then next class, we will try to reformulate uh, the conditions for a force to be conservative. So, example. So right now, we're still kind of building um, a set of tools which can be used in this energy approach, and then we will start applying them for uh, one-dimensional systems, because that's the easiest uh, possible system. Okay, so we have a block sliding uh, an incline. Of course, we have a block sliding out, down an incline. All right, so what is given, uh, probably I will draw the picture here, right? So angle, so let me write what is given, given. So the angle, then there is a friction. So there is a box sliding down. Mass is not given, right? Then what else? Ah, the total distance of the incline. Okay, let me use, no, let me use black. So this total distance is D. And uh, let me check what else. Yeah, that's it. And what we need to find, we need to, ah, yeah, it is released. Of course, you remember it was released. Right, let's say from this point. And what we need to find, we need to find velocity at the bottom. Velocity at the bottom. Right? 
And of course, we will use uh, uh, energy approach. And since, um, yeah, let me introduce first coordinate system, all the forces, and then um, a few words about the uh, solution. So let me introduce, of course, y, x. Of course, we will have to identify all the forces and discuss them. Of course, there will be a normal force. Of course, there will be gravity. And of course, since it slides down, so of course, there will be friction force. Let's label it F. I think just F. Yeah, just F. <coughs> right. And uh, so now we need to discuss each of these forces separately, right? So first of all, Mg. Of course, conservative. And of course, we can introduce potential energy, which is Mg. And the uh, Y, it's a distance from the reference level. Whatever reference level you pick, it's up to you which level to pick. And of course, in this case, since all the motion is above this line, so it makes sense to pick this um, potential energy at this level, position our reference level. at this level. Okay, so, and, and so now it doesn't matter where your coordinate system is. So if I pick this as my reference level, then if an object above, so potential energy is positive, and we just need to use this y, all right, distance from the reference level. And if an object below, potential energy is negative. Of course, I'm talking about the gravitational potential energy. <coughs> okay, so reference level is over here, I showed. then. Uh, normal force. Normal force doesn't do any work, so basically normal force ignores this game completely. It's too cool. It just um, it doesn't play this game, right? N doesn't play this game. Doesn't play this game since work done by the normal force equals to zero. Just completely ignores this. And of course, friction force is a non-conservative force. So uh, friction is, okay, I will write immediately the, exp the expression for the friction force. We've done it in the in example chapter one. So it's a mu mg cosine theta, because this angle theta as well. And, and, yeah, that's it. <coughs> this force is a non-conservative, non-conservative, non right? So it means that, we cannot introduce potential energy, and it means that we will have to use this, right? right. So it means that I will have to calculate change in kinetic energy, change in the potential energy, gravitational potential energy, and it must be equal to the work done by the, okay, let me now write friction force. Work done by the friction force. Okay, now uh, we can stop here, so. And then details, we will finish at okay. If within a few minutes, next class. <clears throat> okay. okay, so that's it. And again, uh, I think we will keep developing tools maybe next class still. Right? And then we will just start applying all these energy tools for one-dimensional system. And, and we will spend maybe two or three classes playing with one-dimensional systems. And only then we will move to um, oscillators. <laughs>